Well, friends, tax time is nearly upon us. At least, if you live in the United States, it is. At least, under current conditions, it is. Anyway, as part of our annual tax time freakout, we have to prepare for a visit from our accountant. And as you may recall, our accountant here at the GM Word of the Week giant bank vault of swimmable cash is a pretty angry fellow. He doesn't like it when you are unprepared, and so he places upon us any number of unreasonable demands. For example, he insists we sort and organize the brown bag and shoebox receipt files by date and expense category. No matter how much we tell him, we only have three categories. Cool things, work things, and things lost down the back of the couch or out in the yard never to be seen again. And as if that weren't bad enough, he insists we do this math thing where we add up all the receipts in each category and present the results to him before he even shows up to fill in the forms. And he was very cross last year when we told him the results were 36, 24, and 36. And even crosser when, after he asked how we could have spent only $24 on work expenses for an entire year, we explained we thought he just wanted to know the number of receipts in each bag. Downright unreasonable he was. This year we've been put on notice. We're to have it all done, and done properly, no later than the 1st of April, or else we're going to be left entirely on our own to figure it out. And if that ends up being the case, well, we might as well work out how to record podcasts from Federal Tennis Prison now and save ourselves some time. The problem is, we aren't particularly good at that whole add a provision and subtractication thing. Oh sure, we can add 2 and 2 and get 4 9 times out of 5, no problem. But an 80% success rate just doesn't cut it on a federal 1040 EIEIO form these days. We do better, but we basically lost interest in math around the 4th grade and never quite got it back, in spite of the best efforts of our father and the chalkboard he screwed to the kitchen wall one day. Problem was, we just couldn't visualize numbers as anything other than the actual name of the number. Fours were four F-O-U-R and not four one, two, three, four of something. So in our head, if you asked us to multiply three by four, you might as well have asked us to multiply green by violin for all the sense it made to us. The word for a number and the concept of the number never got connected in our brain. Eventually, we came up with a workable system, but boy, did it take us a long, long time. And if you think the angry accountant is rough, you ought to see what four hours of math at the kitchen table every night was like for all those years. Had we been born elsewhere or else when, though, it might not have been so hard. Way, way back in the mists of ancient times, back before there was more than a half page worth of double spaced history, they invented something that might have been a big help to us had one been available. And it was based on the simplest system ever. A system so easy that if you understood it, you would know, without even having to count, exactly how many of a thing you had. And that meant you could do amazing feats of calculation that today seem like total miracles. All you have to do is know how to use an abacus. This is GM Word of the Week, and I'm Fiddleback. Prepare yourself for a very loose and speculative trip through history. Not because we made it up, but because no one really knows how it all happened. Going this far back is really an exercise in educated guessing. So effectively, we're telling a story to illustrate a process no one really knows about, but that must have occurred in some fashion at some point in order to get where we are today. Picture yourself back in the ancient Near East. You know, that chunk of land roughly bounded by the Caspian Black and Red Seas as well as the Mediterranean and the Persian Gulf? As for time, well, we're pre-writing and post very few things at all. The people will have worked out the rudiments of animal husbandry and agriculture, but it wasn't too many generations ago when the place you were from was wherever the food was this time last week. If you went looking for what would eventually be Mesopotamia, which we are, you'd find a loose cluster of structures surrounded by a bunch of people who hadn't made up their mind whether or not civilization was going to be a good idea. Newsflash, guys, it's still on shaky ground. Don't commit too early. 
Now zoom in a bit on one particular structure on the outskirts of it all. It's right there, that one, right by the big rock with all the open land behind it. You can just make it out, the half-tent, half-hut with the rough fenced-off area next to it. Zoom in. Enhance. Enhance. There. Now, do you see all those little white cloud-looking things inside the fence moving around and occasionally making a buying noise? Those are sheep. Our friend here, just coming out the door of the hut tent, has a lot of sheep, but also one big problem, which is that he has a lot of sheep. If he had only a few sheep, he wouldn't have a problem at all. But he's made a success of the whole sheep-having thing, and now he has a lot of them. A whole lot. Which, as we said, is the problem. You see, Doodoo, let's call him Doodoo, Doodoo doesn't actually know how many sheep he has. No one has invented counting or numbers yet. In fact, no one has invented any sort of writing at all yet with which to have numbers. He knows he has a lot of sheep, but he has no idea how many a lot really is. It's more than not having any at all, but less than having all the sheep there are in the world. And he can tell he doesn't have all the sheep in the world because his neighbor has some too. Though again, some might be more than a lot. Or it might not. No one really knows. Except that Dudu is increasingly of the opinion that his neighbor's sheep are beginning to seem like a lot too, while Dudu's own sheep are beginning to feel a bit more summish than usual. And it's beginning to bother him. Is his neighbor's a lot that used to be some turning into a lot because some of Dudu's a lot is getting confused with some of his neighbor's some? It's a lot to think about, and Dudu spends a lot of time thinking about it. Remember, Dudu can't just count his sheep one day and then count them again the next to see if he's gained or lost any sheep. A system of counting just doesn't exist at this point. There's no one, two, three, four, five because no one has developed the necessary tools, in this case words and numbers and writing and so forth. At best, Dudu only knows, without really knowing he knows it, ones, twos, and many. Which, according to the book The Axe Maker's Gift, written by the patron saint of the show James Burke and his co-author Robert Ornstein, is the earliest sort of counting we have. This ability of rudimentary counting is probably the basic human understanding of quantity, since it is found in children of all primitive and ancient societies. Still, this doesn't help Dudu very much. How can he tell whether he has the same number of sheep today as he did yesterday, without being able to count exactly how many either of those numbers are? Fortunately, Dudu, living near the big rock as he does, has something else of which he has a lot. Stones. Well, stone chips, but who's counting? Dudu is! And one morning, Dudu gets the bright idea to compare one group of a lot to another group of a lot. As his sheep go out to graze the next morning, Dudu sets down one stone next to the fence for each sheep that passes the gate. Now he knows he has one stone for each one sheep, and for each one sheep there is one stone. Without actually knowing how many he has specifically, he knows he has the same number of sheep as he has stones in the pile. If you walked up to him in the afternoon while the sheep were out grazing and asked him how many sheep he had, Dudu could point to the pile of stones and say, that many. So, in the evening, when all the sheep come back home, Dudu simply removes a rock from the pile for each sheep that enters the gate, and once all the sheep are in, the pile is empty, and Dudu can close the gate and be satisfied that his a lot of sheep are the same a lot he had that morning. Unless they aren't at which point Dudu and his neighbor will have to have words, or at least significant grunting. It's by this method that the concepts of numbers are gradually built up. It's a one-to-one -one representation. For every one of a thing I have, I have one of this other thing. By comparing the things, I can know if I have less, more, or the same amount of the things as I did last time I compared. It takes a lot of time. But eventually people get to the point where they can apply names to the quantities of things they have. At some point down the line, one of Dudu's descendants, Dududimus we'll say, can look out over his flock of sheep and say, I have a lot of sheep, and that a lot is Gizbung sheep. My neighbor, Neborimus, only has some sheep, and that some is a dimp of sheep. Now you, the outsider, might come along one sunny afternoon and ask Dududimus how many sheep he has, and Dudutimus would look at you, point to a pile of stones on the ground, and say, 
Well, odd yet sort of familiar stranger, I have a gizbung, as you can see here represented by Tifkerg. It won't make any sense to you at first, but eventually you'll figure out the problem. See, they haven't worked out quite that one amount of one thing is the same amount as a similar amount of a totally different thing. Where we would say 58 sheep and 58 rocks, Dudu would call them by two totally separate words specific to the kinds of things being counted. Numbers are still very concrete and very one-to-one, -one, such that the name for a number and the thing the number was counting were inseparable. If someone said gizbung to you, it meant 58 sheep, not 58 stones, which was tifkerg. Frankly, it takes several thousand years for people to really get their head around the idea that 58 of something was the same quantity as 58 of something else. Prior to that, a named number meant exactly this specific amount of this specific thing, and you could picture what that was in your head. Something like this still survives today in the Yantan Tethera, a system of numbers still used in parts of England, Scotland, and Wales to count sheep. Though each region has its own variation of it, the Yan Tan Tethera can count any amount of sheep up to 20. Yan is one sheep, Tan is two sheep, Tethera is three sheep, and so on. Once you hit 20 sheep, you had to start over. We'll come back to this in a bit, but just keep it in mind for now. Now there are lots of problems with the doo-doo system. For instance, how do you count things that have more members than there are other things to mark them with? You might have 100 sheep, but only 72 stones to pile up. What then, smart guy? What about trading sheep for other non-sheep things? Do you just throw the now extra stones away? And what if you wanted to trade for future sheep? How do you mark down sheep that don't exist this fall, but will in the spring? And perhaps most importantly, how do you keep from having to haul around as many stones as you have sheep you want to count so that the sheep can be matched to stones wherever they might be? Again, we're skipping over a lot of detail here in part because this isn't a math class in spite of current evidence, and in part because a lot of this is just speculation about how it all happened even from the experts. Since so much of this occurred before writing really existed, you'll be unsurprised to hear that no one wrote down anything about how they worked it out. So we'll leave Dudu and his relatives behind for a bit and summarize a few thousand years of development. Eventually, they work out that they can just make marks, either on the ground or on a stick or what have you, and that those marks can stand for a specific number of anything. As long as everyone agrees on what those marks mean, there's no problem. Five becomes its own concept. Five of anything is the same quantity as five of anything else. And they still knew, because they could look at it directly and associate the concept of five with a concrete example of fiveness, how much five meant. And that solved a lot of problems, mostly centered around having to carry large quantities of stones around to account for other large quantities of things. Thank goodness, because a smart investor would have worked out that the real market was for counting stones and to heck with all the sheep, stools, wheat, and pots everyone else was trading in. The other thing they worked out was the idea of grouping or marking. You remember how we said the Yan Tan Tethera could only count to 20 and then had to start over? Well, the way you started over was to make a mark that indicated a group of 20 had been counted and then start over counting again. When you were done, you counted up to 20 again, made another mark, and so on. So, for example, Yan, Tan, Tethera, Pethera, Pimp, Sethera, Lethera, Hovera, Covera, Dick, Yanadick, Tanadick, Tethera, Dick, Pethera, Dick, Bumfit, Yana, Bumfit, Tana, Bumfit, Tethera, Bumfit, Pethera, Bumfit, Jigget. Make a mark, Yan, Tan, Tethera, and so on count up the number of marks and any non-marked counting you had done, and that was the number of sheep you had. Say, Jigget, Jigget, and Tethra Bumfit. Now, aside from the marking, you'll notice a couple of other things about Yan Tan Tethra counting. First, it's grouped in fives. Yan Tan Tethra Pethra Pimp is the first group and gets us to five. Sethra Lethra Hovera Covera Dick is the second group, taking us to ten. Bumfit ends the third group at 15, and Jigget ends the fourth and last group at 20. The next thing you might notice is that there's some rhyming in use to get us through the first 10. Yan and Tan, Tethra, Pethra, Sethra, and Lethra, followed by Hovera and Kovera. Those all seem to be about helping you remember the next sheep number in sequence. Again, all this varies by region, but the general principles seem to hold. Memorize the first 10, whether you understand them or not, and you can count sheep. 
After the first 10, you simply pick up the last five marker, either Dick or Bumfit, and reapply the first five sheep numbers to them. Yanadick, Tanadick, Tetheradick, Petheradick. Then Bumfit for the next five in the same pattern until you reach the end of the count at Jigget or 20. Then you make your mark. You just have to recite the sheep number you counted to, and everyone will know how many sheep that means. As long as you kept track of the number of marks you made in counting, it would be hard to get it wrong. Marks were generally made in one of three ways. If, for example, you were standing out in the field while the sheep were grazing and wanted to take a quick hit count, you could count your Yantan Tethra and then scuff a mark in the dirt in front of you. Every time you hit Jigget, make another mark on the ground until you had them all tallied. You might also have, since you are in fact a shepherd at this point, your shepherd's crook with you, and you might have cunningly decorated it with marks itself, which would allow you, by moving your fingers from mark to mark, to keep track of how many times you had counted. The third thing you might do is drop a stone into your pocket each time you reach the full count as well, each stone in your pocket marking out one group of 20 sheep. Now go back to our friend Dudu and his descendants. They've been doing grouping and making marks as well. They tended to choose groups of 5 and 10 because they had these wiggly things in front of them called fingers, and boy were they handy when it came to counting things. You could show groups of 10 sheep on your fingers, no problem. And because groups of 10 were so easy, you could lay stones down the same way. Little stones for single units, one slightly larger stone for a group of 5, maybe to show a fist, and two large stones to show two fists for 10. Then if you wanted to trade, say, three sheep to your neighbor, in exchange for three bushels of wheat, all you had to do was take the larger stone and change it down into individual units. Remove three individual units to give to your neighbor, and you still had the right count. With fives and tens, you didn't have to carry individual stones for each and every sheep, but you did have to remember that larger stones stood for more sheep. And now, history gets really super fuzzy. Because this sort of counting has been going on for thousands of years and getting slowly and incrementally improved as the population grows and spreads out. Thanks to this whole new civilization lark, or at least the whole transition from hunter-gatherer to agricultural societies, there's this thing called a surplus now. People have more than they can ever use as an individual, so it makes sense to start trading things you have too much of, like sheep, for things you don't have enough of, like wheat, or other things that don't taste, look, feel, and smell like sheep. And it's going on everywhere with almost everyone. People have to keep track of it all to make sure they know how much they have, how much they need, and how much they let Cousin Dudu borrow on account. There's a whole new system of counting coming along, and not only is language developing, but so is rudimentary mathematics and working with numbers. And it's great all this marking things in the dirt and dropping stones and all that stuff, but it isn't very portable, and you constantly have to set it up over and over again, and wouldn't it be great if the whole process was much smaller and semi-permanent and maybe fit in your pocket while you were at it? Which is why nearly everyone had a go at inventing an abacus of one sort or another. Ancient Sumerians came up with one about 2500 BCE, the Babylonians had one, the ancient Egyptians came up with one that worked in the opposite direction of nearly everyone else, and in 600 BCE, the Persians broke the game wide open when they began exporting their abacuses to India, China, and the Roman Empire. It's hard to know who exactly developed the abacus first, though. Early examples were barely more than the old stone markers. Grooves would be drawn into the sand, inside of which stones or beans would be moved to represent numbers. Gradually, these developed into more portable tablets of wood or stone, with grooves in them, which would hold stones indicating the relative values of the numbers. Each column or groove would represent the usual suspects, ones, tens, hundreds, and so on. And the modern abacus isn't that different from its older counterparts. It generally consists of a rectangular frame divided by a central rail along its length. The division creates an upper and lower deck. A series of rods, usually at least seven, pass from one side of the frame through the division and into the other side, and on these rods a number of beads are placed. One or two beads in the upper deck can either equate to a five or a ten count, and those in the lower deck generally represent the numbers one through four or five, though there are variations on all of this depending on culture, tradition, and need. Each rod represents an overall value. One's on the right, tens, hundreds, and thousands, and so on. To show a number, say 125, you move five beads in the ones column toward the divider rail. 
then two beads in the tens column to the divider rail, and then one bead in the hundreds column. Simple addition and subtraction are accomplished by adding in the appropriate beads in each column to reflect the number being added, and remembering to carry the one, as it were. Multiplication and division are accomplished by setting the initial number, and then adding in that same number the number of times needed. So 3 times 4 begins by setting 3 beads against the rail, then adding 3 beads to it 3 more times, for a total of 4 additions, remembering to carry the 1 by setting the first tens value bead against the rail when the time comes. Easy peasy, he said, without a hint of irony. Advanced users can do square and cube roots as well. The thing is, we have a feeling we actually would have understood basic math better had we used an abacus. It at least would have given us something to visualize as we tried to add, subtract, multiply, and divide. Like Doodoo, it's likely we'd have built up over time a numerical vocabulary in which, on a one-to-one -one basis, we could associate the number four with something definitely four-ish and been able to picture it in our head. That would have simplified things immensely for us during the dark days of fourth grade multiplication. But there's no way in the world we'd ever be able to do what many of the children of Japan and China can do. Use of the abacus, called a sorbon in Japan and a swanpon in China, and forgive us our pronunciations, is still a valued and useful skill in those countries. So much so that parents will sign their children up for special classes focused on teaching their use. The children will sit and dutifully learn to perform complex addition and subtraction of increasingly longer lengths using only the abacus. And, as if that weren't enough, they start doing it on a timer, adding up progressively longer strings of numbers in progressively shorter times. There's even a ranking system similar to that used in Karate or Go to reflect the student's skill level. But why stop there? Real masters of the abacus don't even actually need the abacus. They learn to visualize an abacus mentally and operate it just the same as if they had a physical one. You can even watch their fingers moving the beads of their invisible abacus as they speed through the calculations necessary to add up the string of numbers. And of course, there's a competition to see who is the fastest. It's called Flash Anzan, and the current world record holder is Japan's 20-year-old Hyuga Kinakawa, who can add up 15 sets of three-digit numbers in 1.66 seconds. It took us three years of bowling in our teens before numbers started making sense to us. Thanks for taking the time to listen to the episode. We know things are complicated and maybe a bit iffy out there, so we really appreciate you setting aside part of your day to listen to us. We hope you're staying safe, sane, and well. We'll all get through it. It'll just take some time. Stay focused on the good stuff. Many thanks to our patrons on Patreon. Your support means we have less to worry about in times like this, so a big, huge thanks to all of you. Special shoutouts go to Pugnacious Pugilist and Matt from Monster Island for the very kind reviews on Apple Podcasts. But an extra special shoutout to all of you, just for being you. Keep up the good work. This episode was researched, written, and produced by me, Brian Casey. Music for this episode came from Blue Dot Sessions, purveyors of fine podcasting music to the masses. The abacus is just a visual record of the computations going on in the mind of the person using it.